Hey guys, so today I'm going to react to Sabine Hofstetter's video, Why Is Everyone Suddenly Neurodivergent? And this video was released as of the day I'm recording this five months ago. Um, it's get, received some criticism. I'm pretty sure I watched it five months ago and maybe saw, maybe picked up on some of the parts where it may be criticized. But I'm going to do a reaction, maybe add a little bit to what she says, getting them a few details she doesn't. Um, kind of my criteria is if I were to tell someone uh, that I have autism and then say, watch this video, what would be their impression uh, after watching this video? Would they have a better understanding of, guess, of me or how my brain works from for that aspect? I don't know. So anyway, let's go ahead and start this. I'm going to do the transition. Okay, here we go. Um, let me reset this thing. I could have did this before I started recording, but... You guys get to see the, the sausage being made. Um, all right. In 2003, Simon Baron Cohen, a clinical psychologist at the University of Cambridge, claimed that Albert Einstein had autism. Elon Musk has said he has Asperger's syndrome. And if you ask Google, you'll find many lists of famous people who supposedly have autism, usually with the preamble, though he was not diagnosed. It's been attributed to Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates and Eminem, none of whom ever said anything to deny or confirm it. What's going on? OK, I've been accused of interrupting uh, the people in my reaction videos a bit too much. I'll try not to do so much here. Um, so just to make a, f a few statements here. So the whole thing about Einstein, everyone has probably heard the stories about how Einstein wasn't a very good student and how he failed algebra. Um, how he didn't learn to speak till he was like 10 or whatever. Um, so the reality of it is, is that Einstein was about two and a half years old the first time he, he did speak, which um, is is late. I think by, the, by 18 months to 24 months, most children have at least a 50-word vocabulary. And by two years, I think they're able to have very basic conversations. Um, but it seems that when Einstein did start speaking, he was... It's not hyperlexic. I think hyperlexic people who read at an early age, I can't remember what the people who, who once they, who are basically their speaking ability is above their age. But that was, once he did start speaking, it seemed to be the case. And he did do something called echolalia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is repeating words and phrases. And he did that till he's about seven years old. He would say something. And as his parents and family described, he would say something. He's very thoughtful and intentional with his, with his, speak, his speech. And then he would kind of repeat things to himself, which echolalia is actually a sign of autism. Um, as far as being a student, he was actually a very good student. And his teachers noticed that he was an exceptional student from a young age. But there is no tie between speech delay and intelligence one way or the other. You'll have people who have, uh, and she'll talk about a little bit what we traditionally called autism, who did who did have speech delays, who are exceptional intelligence. As far as those other people, um, we're kind of attributing certain properties to or labels to people who seem to have certain characteristics. And the one thing is, of course, diagnosing people in any type of medical uh, in any type of medical capacity, especially in psychology, is dangerous. But also, when you're talking about public figures. It's a matter of how you present yourself to the public. You guys can see some of my videos and uh, even me where I will act. I probably seem different, like I'm acting different, different personality, different videos. And people put on masks. Uh, we'll talk about masking in the sense of autism, but people have a public persona. And that public persona may seem like autism. Let's say that. As I make this video now, I'm really trying to present myself. This is this is actually me. This is the way if if uh, if you knew me well and you're having a conversation, I'm in a neutral mood. This is the way I would act. Um, but I do performance in life or as people call it, masking all the time. In my classes, I basically perform the classes where I teach. And a matter of fact, I had a recent evaluation and the evaluator was surprised by how lively and entertaining and funny I was in class is because when I talk to her, uh, it's more like this. I mean, I know it was like YouTube's supposed to be entertaining. Maybe I should put that mask on now. But um, this is this is the way I would speak to my uh, 
I don't know if I said advisor, my supervisor, but in class, I'm more lively and more, you know, active and make more jokes. But really, this is this is me. Um, and as far as how why Elon Musk says Asperger's, a lot of people still say, say that it's an outdated term and she'll explain why. And I've had um, I've actually gotten into kind of disagreements and debates with other people on the spectrum over this. Um, but uh, Look, if you don't want to have the uh, label named after a, a person who worked with the Nazis, I think that's your right. Anyway, let me continue. Why does everyone suddenly have autism? How is it different from Asperger's syndrome? What does neurodivergent mean? And what is internalized ableism? Am I autistic? That's what we'll talk about today. First things first, what is autism? The term autism was introduced in 1911 by the Swiss psychiatrist Eugen Bleuler. He used it to describe what he believed to be a childhood version of schizophrenia. The term autism alludes to the Greek word autos, which means self, a word that Bleuler used because the children seem to be detached from reality and withdrawn into their inner world, even though they didn't have smartphones back then. Autism was later... Okay, so this is kind of interesting because my earliest memories of interacting with people was actually observing them. And it always seemed like I, I displayed when I was younger, I was not, um, I did not have delayed development, but when I was younger, I displayed what's referred to as, as um, I think it's called uh, selective mutism. And basically, it's where you don't speak to certain people. I don't know why I did this. I didn't even realize why I was doing it. It's something I found out years later where my parents would say, no, uh, your certain teachers and certain students say you don't talk. And my parents would be like, well, he does talk when he's at home. He just doesn't want to talk there. And if you would have asked me what was going on, I was kind of in my head. Like I would be observing the world and I would be going through things in my head. And uh, even now... Um, I can go an entire, believe it or not, an entire weekend, which I've done before until I started doing this, where I do speak for videos, but I would go an entire weekend without speaking. And I wouldn't realize it because I would be having conversations in my head. Um, just, it is an, a, a, I guess to say a, a rich inner world, so rich that you don't even realize that you're not engaging with the outside world in the same way that other people do recognized as a condition independent from schizophrenia. Today, the diagnosis of autism includes learning difficulties, especially with language and speech, trouble with verbal and nonverbal communication, avoiding eye contact, repetitive movements, specialized and often obsessive interests or behaviors, difficulties with emotional control, and extreme reactions to stimuli, such as light, touch, or noise. Autistic people also sometimes have unusual abilities, such as a remarkable memory for facts, numbers, or visual details, or doing mental arithmetic. This combination of cognitive problems and abilities is the reason why some autistic people were once regarded idiot savants. However, the word id... Okay, so talking about savant syndrome, I am uh, not a savant. If I were, I'd probably be on some talk show multiplying like 10 digit numbers in my head. But as far as being able to recall facts and figures and whatnot, I had the uh, nickname in, when I was um, in elementary school, Encyclopedia Brown, uh, which is very creative, I know. But part of that was one I would, I would read, literally sit and read encyclopedias, but it's being able to recall things um, much more efficient and easier than other people. Um, yeah, it's just... I, I, that's something I noticed early on is being able to kind of pick up. It's it's really strange. Like I can remember facts. I can remember details of numbers and figures better. I shouldn't say better, but faster than a lot of people can. But I can't remember things like people's birthdays. Um, I, when I see people in public, I may not recognize their face. I'm not 100% sure it's the person I think it is, which is a strange thing. I'm bad at, rem uh, at, at recognizing people that I may see three, four, five times a day for, for weeks at a time, like students. But then when the same student shows up and they're wearing a hat when they haven't worn a hat before, I'll notice it. Um, 
So it's strange. It's 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 a bit strange like that. Um, the other things, yeah. You, how much of that do would I say is representing me with such sensitivity? Yeah, I have a sensitivity to sounds and smells, and I I interpreted that sensitivity as me being kind of a, a grumpy person. And now when I look back at it, I realize that I'm not grumpy with things. It's just that when I hear loud noises in public or people are wearing like strong perfume, my tolerance for it is much lower than other people's. So uh, that's the uh, kind of the effect of that. Um, let me continue with this. It has drifted in meaning since then and is now considered an insult, so the condition has been renamed to Savant Syndrome. Most people had probably never heard of autism until Dustin Hoffman introduced it to the world in 1988 with the movie Rain Man. The movie was inspired by Kim Peek, one of the most famous savants ever. But, plot twist, while Peek had originally been diagnosed with autism, in 2008 a group of doctors studied MRI images of his brain and concluded that he wasn't autistic but most likely had FG syndrome, a genetic condition linked to abnormalities of the X chromosome. In 1943, the Austrian pediatrician Hans Asperger described a group of children that who had difficulties with social interactions and communication, like autistic people, but who did not have the same troubles with language and cognitive function. This high-functioning autism became later called Asperger's syndrome. Fast forward 70 years and psychologists decided that there is no clear distinction between Asperger's syndrome and autism and the term high-functioning autism is neither useful nor descriptive. Instead, there is an entire spectrum of symptoms with expressions that greatly vary. This is why the term Asperger's... Okay, so this is a point of contention for a lot of people with autism because they feel like the label which they felt was descriptive is taken away. And basically one of the, one of the basic differences between what's considered uh, tr uh, traditionally high functioning autism, which is kind of problematic in itself in Asperger's, is that high functioning autism um, also included things like developmental delays like speech and, and, and maybe walking or crawling or things like that. Meanwhile, Asperger's, there were, there was no, um, de there were no delays in, in, um, developmental milestones. But when you get into things like, um, repetitive movements, uh, adherence to strict routines, special interests, that's where the, inter that's where the overlap go is. Now, from the aspect of, of being a clinician, I can't really speak of that because I'm not a clinician or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but I can look at it from the, from the prospect of being a, an, an educator. And looking at it from the realm of being an educator, whether I have someone with high-functioning autism or whether I have someone with Asperger's, I know that when I am creating the classroom condition, I'm, I need to be aware of things such as like uh, having a situation where there's too much stimulus, um, being, I guess, sensitive to how I communicate things to people, how people may learn differently. So from that aspect, from someone who's working with someone uh, or people on the spectrum, whether it's Asperger's or whether it's um, high-functioning autism or what was called Asperger's at one point, it's not really as important. As important. And also, even with two individuals which would have had, who, who would have had originally what was called Asperger's, there's still going to be a spectrum. Even now in my classes, I know of two students uh, who have uh, who who were diagnosed with autism as children. One of them was diagnosed with what was traditionally called uh, autism, and another one was diagnosed with what which would have been called Asperger's. And I know this one because well, one of the students just he kind of told me, which when I found that it really wasn't all that surprising. I actually think he may have dyscalculia on top of it. But also have another student who, uh, or the other student, he has a, 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 um, an IEP, an end of us education plan. Okay. The syndrome is no longer in use today. It's now called Autism Spectrum Disorder, ASD for short. ASD subsumes both Asperger's syndrome, autism, and some other developmental disorders. Why Elon Musk referred to a retired expression like Asperger's is anyone's guess? Maybe he spends too much time with this old paper app called Twitter. 
Besides the previously mentioned difficulties with language, social interactions, emotional control and repetitive behavior, studies have found that ASD is correlated with anxiety, sleep problems, seizures and an elevated risk of gastrointestinal problems. Symptoms of ASD are usually diagnosed in early childhood and persist throughout life, though they can improve or get worse. The spectrum of Okay. So the thing about being intestinal problems, I, as some, I'm not a medical doctor, but uh, I have a personal theory, theory, which is a great thing to share now, you know, saying that I'm not a professional. So um, the, uh, you, you basically have a, so many nervous, uh, or how can I say this? You basically have so many, um, I don't know how to say this, uh, cells of the nervous system I, 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 there's i what is it 100 million uh i am going blank on this but basically the cells that make up the brain if you're watching this you guys are like you know it is come on but uh basically you have the same number of cells in your stomach your digestive system uh the same number of cells as a cat's brain and there's a book that's referred that's called the second brain uh, by a guy named Michael Gershon, where he talks about this. So if we look at autism as being a, and I don't want to, s to say disability or to say uh, a disorder, but let's just say a difference in the nervous system, I think it's linked to that, that basically human beings have a second brain in their digestive tract. Um, I'm going to be going through this video and then I'm going to, I'm going to remember the, 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 the word. I know if you're watching this, you're probably screaming like, really, you couldn't remember that? No, I went blank on it. But anyway, you basically have like a second brain the size of a cat's brain in your stomach. So I think that's probably, I think the, the link to the digestive problems could be there because the other conditions such as seizures and anxiety, it's, it's, they're nervous, they're nervous system issues. Of the disorder does not refer to the strength of the symptoms, but rather their variety. How strong the symptoms are is measured separately by three different levels, which indicate how much support the person needs. One is the lowest level, three the highest. Of course, no one likes to use a clunky term like autism spectrum disorder, which is why most people still refer to it as just autism. To avoid confusion, what was previously called autism is now often called classical autism. The other expression that has taken hold for having autism spectrum disorder is being on the spectrum, though I now think they should have called it quantum autism. Several studies have shown that the brains of children with ASD develop differently than those of most children, and that this difference is often visible in brain scans before the onset of symptoms. For example, a 2017 paper in Nature found that in ASD children, some parts of the brain grow noticeably faster than average, and that this growth is linked to the severity of social difficulties. Other studies have shown that compared to the Okay, so one of the criteria to be diagnosed with autism is that these conditions um, are, have to be present since childhood. And the reason why is because there could be other factors which, which cause uh, autism-like symptoms that you have maybe been exposed to um, after birth or something like that, whatever, right? Um, so I did not get... I did not get screened whatever until i was 40 right um but when i talked to my my parents specifically my mother i had signs since i before i could um before i could speak so for example i had a preference for uh wearing clothes of a certain texture and a certain color and this kind of leads to the whole thing of making accommodations and why i was probably never uh it was never a an issue with me is that when I had these preferences for things, like I would, uh, like I had preferences for routine, certain routines, preferences for wearing certain things, my mother was very accommodating. Both of my parents were very accommodating of it for the most part. So what would happen is that before I could speak, my, mo I would, my mother would dress me and I would take the clothes off. So my mother would put the clothes out on the bed and she would just let me, eventually she figured out what things I like to wear. And then eventually, and this is before I could speak, I would just kind of grab the things I wanted to put on. Um, so there was a preference in textures and, and colors. Even now, if you guys watch my videos, you'll you see that 
you, you may think I'm wearing like one of three shirts in every video and I'm not. I just have, you know, I have four versions of the same shirt. Like even this sweater, I think I have three versions of this sweater. Um, it's not a, and the funny thing is it's not a conscious thing I do. It's just that over the years, I've just kind of gravitated towards buying. I didn't even notice I was doing it. It's buying the same things over and over. Um, I buy something, I like it. I'll buy four or five of it. And also just having a color preference. Average person, people with ASD have significantly few connections between parts of the brain that are used for social interactions and instead more local connections in regions associated with sensory control. These properties can be inferred from brain scans before the age of two. How common is autism spectrum disorder? The worldwide prevalence of ASD is about 1%, but in high-income countries, some estimates say the rate is higher. For example, a 2018 review by researchers from the UK found that ASD prevalence in England and North America is between 2.4 and almost 10%, depending on region. According to the American Center for Disease Control, about 1 in 36 children in the United States were diagnosed with ASD. So here's something interesting, they say according to region. So one of those things that can affect the prevalence of autism or at least autism-like symptoms is the industry in the area. So for example, if you go to Silicon Valley and California, where you have a lot of these programmers and engineers, there's a, uh, and you were to test people, there's a larger prevalence of people with autism-like uh, symptoms. Um, yeah. Make, make of that what you will, I guess. ...in 2020. Probably quite a few of you who are watching this video are autistic. I'm afraid I have nothing whatsoever new to tell you. The number for ASD diagnoses has increased substantially over the past two decades. In 2000, mm. it was only one in 150 children who were diagnosed in the US. This means the number has increased by almost a factor of five in 20 years. <coughs> the increase in the UK has been even faster, almost a factor eight in the same period. The major reason for this is higher awareness and better screening. At the same time, the fraction of those severely affected by ASD is dropping. In the 1980s, more than two thirds of people diagnosed with autism also had an intellectual disability. By 2018, the fraction of ASD children in the US classified with an intellectual disability, that's an IQ below 70, was 31%. This decrease of the fraction of those with severe disability is also likely due to the enhanced awareness and screening, which picks up on the less obvious cases. At the moment, there are about four times more men than women diagnosed with ASD. The reasons for this are not well understood. Several studies have shown that... Okay, so they say this basically the, the traits are the... Um, that the way that uh, autism is displayed in women and men is going to be different. There's also just a straight up prejudice that goes when it comes to diagnosing women that uh, even now, even now there are doctors who say, look, a girl, little girls can't have autism. I don't know where they get this from. And it's very unfortunate because, well, I mean, obvious unfortunate because, you know, you, you have little girls who are going through the education system. They could be, you know, having accommodations for schooling and to sit there and, you know, to deny these things that would help. You know, the other thing that happens is that minorities are under, um, are underdiagnosed, but that's across the board with a lot of conditions. A lot of times, specifically with, with young black boys, behaviors which if it was with white children would be, specifically white boys would be considered, you know, they could identify things such as um, uh, ADHD, um, anxiety. Uh, they, little black boys get labeled as just being disruptive and, and being a problem. So there's a discrimination tied to gender as well as race when it comes to diagnosing people with autism. That young girls are less likely to be diagnosed with ASD because they're better at hiding symptoms, a strategy that's referred to as masking. Masking includes copying facial expressions and social behavior or memorizing a repertoire of answers to questions that'll be accepted as normal enough. 
While masking might help girls with social integration, it can cause other mental health problems such as depression, anxiety and low self-esteem. In later life, ASD in girls might get covered up by conditions such as eating disorders or OCD. Girls might also be more successful at masking because their social environment makes it easier. For example, a 2017 paper by American researchers observed 96 elementary school children, half of which with ASD. They found that ASD girls weaved in and out of social activities in loose groups, making it hard for anyone to tell whether they integrated well. Boys, on the other hand, tended to play organized games and the ASD boys just played alone, so they stood out much more obviously how much of the sex okay so the funny thing with this is that when it comes to the a lot of the traditional signs of autism that boys show and as opposed to girls i actually show more of the signs of what what girls would do so what they're referring to the kind of weaving in and out of social situations there's actually a term for what's called flit i think it's pronounced flitting uh, like birds or butterfly, a butterfly flitting from one flower to another. Uh, someone to kind of read on this is a, I think it's a psychologist named Amanda Gal, uh, Gausrund. I think it's Amanda Gausrund. And basically it's the phenomena of, just imagine you're at the, uh, you see kids playing during recess and going from one group to another. You know, the girls over here are playing hopscotch, then you know, 20 minutes later, maybe the next day you're with another group of girls. And that's what I did, actually. Um, a, lot of, a lot of kids have to deal with bullying. I never dealt, really dealt with bull. I mean, other than, you know, the standard bullying that a lot of, that you're going to get. Well, I think one of the reasons I didn't get deal with bullying much is because I was, I could be aggressive. And if I were, if I was getting bullied, I would actually, I, I wasn't hesitant to fight people. But a lot of it was just, um, I was I may I kind of hung out with enough people that it was like yeah you know so one day I may be playing four square the other day I may be doing with this group I'd even do even hang out with the girls sometime like me as an eight year old nine year old I remember sometimes the girls would be doing cartwheels and I'm like well today I'm going to hang out with the girls and do cartwheels um, so then when I wanted to spend the week sitting in the library reading encyclopedias. Uh, it was fine because, you know, the previous week I was outside playing with all these different groups. But did I have like any close connections with any one group? Not really. Um, I did not. I mean, I occasionally would have a friend. I would have a friend or maybe two friends. And the funny thing is, is even when I had a friend and this is up to high school, that was the friend or maybe two or three friends or a small friend group, but I was never just like really embedded with them. And they would also have their thing. So it was not unusual for me to like disappear from my friends for like a week while they're doing, you know, a very concrete example. For example, in high school, uh, I had a group of friends. They would get together on the weekends and play uh, these computer games. And it just wasn't a thing I would do. And they would sometimes they would get together and do things, and it was just a thing I wouldn't, I wouldn't do a lot of times because I just wanted to be by myself. So I would hop from group to group. And the masking thing, this was actually how it was first suggested to me that I was on the, uh, I was on the spectrum. This is some years back. I was talking to a friend of mine, who was um, she's a therapist, and I told her how it was very difficult for me to date. And I basically figured out a essentially a script to dating. Like I would say, well, then you say this and you learn to ask questions. And then if somebody says this, and it was basically textbook, uh, masking textbook script, you know, script writing. I didn't recognize this. That not only did I, it wasn't just dating. It was actually just whenever I would move to a new town and have to meet people. Um, I just learned like I, I learned like a basic thing like you know if you want to meet people just ask them questions and then if they do this you do this and if they do this you do this and my friend who is the um she's the therapist she she kind of picked up on that right away that along with some other other behaviors I had that were in hindsight were pretty obvious this difference in ASD diagnosis is due to masking is presently unclear. What is clear, however, is that diagnosing girls requires other methods than those used for boys.
ASD is normally diagnosed in childhood below the age of five, especially now that doctors look for symptoms during regular childhood screening. However, this is a fairly recent development. The increasing awareness of the condition has also resulted in larger numbers of people being diagnosed later in life because they fell through the cracks as children. Still, it can take a long Yeah, that's me. And also, uh, I was, it was suggested that I be delayed into entering kindergarten to my teachers or to my mother uh, from preschool teachers because basically they saw me as not being um, uh, as my social skills being developed enough. And it basically came down to my mother took me to a, a, a somewhere to get me tested for essentially, uh, in, I don't want to say intelligence, but basically intelligence. And I did really well. So my mother was like, look, he doesn't want to talk to people the way most kids do. He keeps himself. That's not really what the big problem is. How does he perform? You know, can he can he learn colors? Can he learn letters? And the answer was, yeah, I actually picked up on that stuff faster and earlier than most kids. So, I mean, there was not only was there no delayed uh, or no mental impairment, there was advanced, I'd say, get gifted. I mean... I mean, I have a PhD in math, so that's not the most surprising thing in the world. I mean, not to sound arrogant, but this is what it is. Long time, sometimes years, to get a diagnosis. It's a problem because the lack of diagnosis can make it more difficult to cope. A study done in the UK estimated that 10% of suicide victims had signs of undiagnosed autism. What causes it? Classical autism was originally believed to be a psychological condition that results from poor parenting. This idea was pushed in particular by the psychiatrist Leo Kanner. He argued that the leading cause of autism was the refrigerator mother who didn't love her child as she should have. We now know that ASD is not the fault of maternal temperatures, but an unusual variation of neurodevelopment with a strong so yeah both of my parents were very very affectionate and loving um if anything i'm probably not probably i was i'm less affectionate than my parents are my father was a hugger he was he had no problem saying he loved me my mother had no problem saying love me uh love me i i'm not much of a hugger but it's not the refrigerator problem i had very very affectionate accommodating parents so that no I just came out of the oven this way. If anything, I look back at it, it's probably, I kind of, you know, my father's no longer, is no longer alive, but I do, looking back, I do suspect he was on the spectrum, actually. They talk about that here. Hereditary component. That is, children of people with ASD are considerably more likely to also have it. Different studies have put the probability at about 40 to 80 percent. Part of the difficulty of pinning the number down is that ASD has so many different facets, there are loads of genes involved, and quite possibly some aspects of it are more, others less hereditary. Some environmental factors also seem to play a role. For example, some studies have found a link between obesity or diabetes of the mother and ASD of the child. Though the increase in the odds ratio is not large, and as it's often the case with studies like this, it's difficult to infer causation from a correlation because there could be underlying causes linking both. A 2016 meta-analysis by a group of Chinese researchers looked at the link between the age of the parents and the chance of the child to have ASD. They took into account 27 studies with a total of almost 67,000 cases and found a clear correlation, especially with the age of the father. Per every increase of 10 years in maternal and paternal age, they found an associated 18% and 21% higher risk of ASD, respectively. We've also learned about a few things that do Sorry, I sat there and I didn't mean to do that. So the thing that's got me wondering about that is, and I'm sure they did this in the study. I'd, I'd like to read the paper because at least I think I, the, the mathematical, the statistical aspects of it, I'm fairly sure I would understand, is that when they find this link between the age of the father and the prevalence of autism, are they taking into account, uh, do, how much are they taking into account uh, fathers who had children at a younger age, and hear me out here, it, could it be the case that men who have autism, uh, when they do have children, 
are having children later in life. Another thing I would like to know is that when you look at people who have autism, who have children, do men on average have children at an older age than women who have children with autism? I've, 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 I know the numbers say that I think it's something like, um, oh man, is it 20% maybe? I get this. I, honestly, I get the employment and the marriage sets kind of conflated. I get them confused. But it may be something like it's, it's, it's either 20% or less than 20% of people on the spectrum will ever get married. I think it's less than that. But I would like to know what those numbers are for men compared to women. If I had to guess, it's probably, uh, I'd say that men, and we're talking about level one autism, like support, low support needs people without mental impairments. Um, because I can tell you one thing, like there's so many components when it comes to relationships and dating so many subtle things that are uh, unspoken communication, it can be difficult. I mean, dating is hard for people. Is dating is hard for people in general, but when your basic level of communication, understanding things, it's difficult and it's very frustrating. And I'm not saying that things are inherently easier for women in that regard, but I kind of think at least, I kind of wonder basically is is like our concessions made. Um, when it comes to that aspect with women, with men meeting women, I don't know. I'm just speculating there. I don't want to be out of line. Not cause it. I'll hey guys, so I just wanted to make a comment about this. The reality of it is, is that women on the spectrum are more likely to be taken uh, advantage of uh, sexually. I don't know if this stand, if this is true for women who are high functioning, but there is a tendency for people with autism or autistic people, as I prefer to say, to kind of uh, maybe disproportionately trust people, to take people at their word. So uh, it often makes people who, who are autistic easy targets. And the case that comes to mind is Alicia Navarro. I'm not going to put a picture of her up. Even though she's an adult now, you guys can look it up on your own. But basically, she was a 14-year-old girl with um with autism who wasn't diagnosed until she was 12, even though she had all of the classic, you know, character traits. And she met a man online who I believe when she met the man, it was either he was 36 at the time or he was 32. And then she was suddenly found four years later in um, Montana, close to the Canadian border. And I believe the man's being charged with other crimes related to exploitation of children. But for that thing where he'd been grooming this young girl since she was 14 and she ran off and had been living with him, I don't think he will face, he may not face any consequences for that. Um, so, yeah. Other than cold mums, for example, vaccines. In 1998, an anti-vaccine activist managed to publish a fraudulent paper in The Lancet claiming that measles vaccines cause autism. He was struck off the medical register and the paper was retracted. If you're watching this channel, you probably don't need to be told, but vaccines don't cause autism. Okay, so she had his name listed there, but she didn't mention him by name. And that's kind of like, don't put any more light on this fool, but I will mention his name. So the guy's name is Andrew Wakefield. He published his paper in 1998. He is a discredited physician. He lost his license. Um, knowing nothing about uh, medicine or research, but knowing about statistics and math. So this guy was a gastroenterologist and he writes a paper on autism. Right away, there's huge red flags because his sample size was 12. He had a, uh, and he had a sample size of 12 children, if I can remember correct. Anybody who knows anything about any type of study, uh, there is no study where a sample size of 12 is significant. So he's kind of the ground zero of, um, of, of, of va vaccines being associated with autism. This is how bad it is. Um, some years ago, I interviewed with a school, it was like a, a health school where they had like nursing degrees and um, some other health related degrees. I was interviewing there for a job. This was actually the first place I interviewed with uh, after I finished my, my PhD. And uh, so this is years before I knew definitively that I was, that I even was on the spectrum. 
and I'm giving a presentation and I don't know how it came up, but one of the people there who was a, who was a math teacher uh, said how her grandson had, had nothing wrong with them, got the uh, vaccine and then suddenly boom, had autism. And this woman, this is an educated woman who works at a health, a health college. What people fail to understand is the, uh, the age in which people are getting vaccines, the age in which babies are getting vaccines, is about the age you would notice people have the signs of autism. Correlation and causation, there's a difference there, guys. Yeah, Wakefield, is, he's, this is unfortunate, that's all. They don't cause autism spectrum disorder either. To name just one example, a 2014 meta-analysis summarized 10 different studies and found no evidence but of even the relation now, people, between vaccination and the ASD. damage is done. Other things that don't cause ASD are caesarean sections, in vitro fertilization, plastic wrappers, bacterial infections, and watching YouTube. ASD is the lifelong condition. There's no cure and there's no medication. However, early diagnosis and intervention with suitably targeted programs can greatly improve life satisfaction and medication as well as psychotherapy can be used to deal with some of the symptoms. Currently, the treatment focus is on psychological and social support for ASD children and their families. Some young autistic people don't speak at all and can benefit from using picture cards or speech generating devices. Targeted programs that are started as early as possible can improve attention, language development, social engagement and can reduce the severity of symptoms later in life. The most successful of these... Okay, I shouldn't have paused. I think she's going to say it. Let me... I'm positive. I think she's going to say it. Programs are those which include parents and schools, because much of it comes down to other people understanding triggers and trying to avoid them. For example, children with AS. Okay, I should have. I sh maybe I should have just paused. She didn't say it. So if you look at that list of things, let me see here if I can rewind it. So they have applied behavioral analysis right there, right? And a lot of people have problems with applied behavior analysis because basically I may be in the wrong with this, but my understanding is applied behavioral analysis is essentially act the way you're supposed to act. That's probably an over, uh, uh, oversimplification of it. And it's, it's teaching people to basically hide their, their autistic um, behavior. And let me tell you something, guys, when you have to, I don't think it's hard to, it's hard to explain how difficult, how, let me say that, how stressful that is when you're told to not do the things. I'll just, I, I don't know why I'm trying to mince words with this or be, be, you know, but it's just, it's, it's bad. It's damaging. It's abusive to tell kids don't stem stare look look at me in the eyes whatever when it doesn't come natural when it hurts um yeah that's so that's yeah I, and i say eh, let me keep going i don't this thing's going on too long let me keep going some slater in life the most successful of these programs are those which include parents and schools, because much of it comes down to other people understanding triggers and trying to avoid them. For example, children with ASD might be bad at rapidly switching between tasks or be unable to read nonverbal clues, both of which can be avoided to a large degree. They also often use repetitive motion, such as rocking or hand flapping, to calm themselves down, a behavior referred to as stimming. Asking them to stop is exactly the wrong thing to do. Those are some examples where awareness among other people can really make a big difference. Like there are that. also okay. some medications to treat co-occurring symptoms like irritability, agitation, anxiety or depression, and some might benefit from cognitive behavioral therapy. However, there is no one-size-fits-all approach because the symptoms of ASD are so varied. According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 
autism spectrum disorder is a mental health disorder. However, a lot of people with ASD and other conditions that have traditionally been labelled disorders feel that description is inappropriate. Just because they're not typical doesn't mean there's something wrong with them. The term that many of them prefer is that they are neurodiverse as opposed to neurotypical. The term neurodiverse refers to a group, whereas an individual would be described as neurodivergent. Neurodiversity includes not just ASD, but also attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, dyslexia and few other conditions. The term neurodiversity was coined in the late 1990s by the Australian sociologist Judy Singer, loosely based on the expression biodiversity. She saw it as an extension of social justice movements that had given women and homosexuals rights they should have had all along. Singer argued that neurodivergent people had not been given their rightful place in society either, and it was about time to stop pathologizing them. The neurodiversity movement so they're not going to get into details, but basically not, not only does it include things like autism and ADHD and uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, but even things like people who have uh, PTSD and head and even head traumas where the, uh, the neural, the neural workings of the brain have been changed uh, by, by whatever trauma falls into this category as well. So weave together with the American social justice <clears throat> movement and developed an extremist part. By 2013, some neurodiversity advocates wrote that autism and ADHD are the result of normal natural variation in the human genome. By 2019, some said that the real problem is the dominant ableist culture of society that sets standards for what it means to be normal. An ableist is someone who believes that typical abilities are superior. If you're neurodivergent but have internalized ableism, you may mistakenly blame yourself for the challenges you face when in fact the problem lies with the societal barriers and discrimination that make it harder for neurodivergent people to thrive. Some of them have put the idea... Okay, so me personally, I am very happy with the way my brain works in in the regards of how it works differently than other people 95% of my life. And what I mean by not 95% as in I've been on this earth for 40 plus years and 95% of those years. No, I mean just in life. Most of the time I'm very happy. Where I, where I do sometimes wish I could be like everyone else is when it comes to the actual, and this is the deficit. So when it comes to socializing, I like how my brain organizes things. I like the way I'm able to see patterns. I like the way I, I like, you know, bringing structure because I like structure. I don't mind it. But when it comes to, and there, and this is something I've dealt with my whole life and at various points of, I felt varying degrees of aloneness is being able to connect to people the way other people seem to be able to do it. It does seem like everybody else just manages to just understand in a way that I don't get it. Or even if I tried to do it, it would not be natural. It feels uncomfortable. And that is the thing. That is the time where I'm just like, I do. F I don't think it's internalized ableism, but that's just reality of it. Even now, uh, I, I can tell that I do get along. I think I get along better with other people who are neurodivergent than people who are um, neurotypical it's almost like if i if i meet someone and it's just easy to talk to them i'm it's just a matter of time before they kind of tell me at some point oh yeah i have adhd or yes i have i've uh I've, I've, I've ocd or i have some type of trauma and i don't know why that is and i think i've mentioned this before where i had a boss who she had um she had a uh, ocd and I, I, I think in some regard, it was like I could maybe kind of con connect with her better than I can could uh, a lot of the other people that I worked with. I don't know. Okay. ...of treating autism on the same level as the idea of treating homosexuality. For example, Autism Speaks is a charitable organization with the stated <sighs> goal of creating an inclusive world for all individuals with autism throughout their 
Okay, guys, this is this is where the controversy came. This is where the criticism, I'm sure, people gave. If it wasn't before, it was this one. Autism Speaks has tried to change up how they're present. They've tried to change their image. There's a great video by uh, I think it's Foster on the Spectrum, another YouTuber. I may put their uh, their link in the description. But Autism Speak. Uh, speak, speak, whatever, until recently was like, we're trying to cure, we're trying to cure autism. That's what it, it comes down to. And look, well, I'll let it keep going, but that's, yeah, I don't, let's see what she says about Autism Speaks here. A lifespan. They partnered with Google on a project called Missing to develop a database. How do you measure the awareness of autism, of autism anyway? <laughs> on their website, yeah, okay. they described the project's mission as to identify many subtypes of autism mm -hmm. with the goal of developing more personalized and effective treatments. Two years ago, the project was decried by some people on Twitter as eugenics, the Nazi doctrine of cleaning society from genetically inferior groups, which back then included disabled and autistic people. It seems to me that these tweets attacking the missing project were severely misrepresenting what the project website stated. Nevertheless, no. Autism Speaks, which I remind you is a charitable organization that supports autistic people, has been labeled a hate group by some activists. Oh, Sabine, she did not do her research. She's not looking at... We did not wake up in a vacuum, Sabine. You got to look at what this group was doing before. They've cleaned up their, their... I say they cleaned up their... They've just cleaned up their image. I don't think they've cleaned up their intent. Right. Because the thing is, like, there are certain guys, there are certain states where I don't know, states and countries. Well, for example, there are certain countries where they don't allow you to immigrate into the country. I think I want to say is New Zealand when I don't want to speak. I see I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't know if it's New Zealand or Australia. And I don't want to speak out of turn. And I kind of wish I hadn't said that, but I'm not going to take it out. But where they discriminate on people immigrating into the country who have autism. I have to look that up. Also, uh, when you're trying certain states that when you were trying to get a an abortion, the abortion laws have changed in the in the past since Roe versus Wade has been uh, re repealed. So, but before uh, the, the the time you could get, have an abortion, you could it was extended if you knew if you were uh, what was it? Oh no, that was for um oh this that was actually for Down syndrome. So if you can, so think about that, it was, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but if you could test your child for Down syndrome, you could get an abortion later in the term. So if they're doing it for Down syndrome, why are they not going to do it for autism? Because here's the thing, guys, I'm sitting in front of you and I'm, I'm telling you, like, I have autism. And everybody's like, oh, okay, you're having a conversation and I'm telling you, like, I'm a teacher and I have a PhD and I was in the military and whatever. But... When you have people who have level three autism or they have high support needs for the rest of their life, they'll they'll need to be taken care of. And if you can find that gene and the question is, do, do the genes look the same? Does, do, do I have the same gene? Would I have the same gene? Whatever, uh, uh, I guess uh, <laughs> I hear the word I'm, I'm trying to look in for, but like the same key or the same flag or whatever is someone who has level three autism that will need support their whole life but even if i didn't have that doesn't that person as a human being as a have the same right to exist so that autism speaks you have to look you have to look at the history of this organization I honestly think they've just cleaned up their image but i don't know if they've changed their intent so like i said uh foster on the uh, foster on the spectrum has a great video i'll include the link in the descriptions in my video this extreme position seems to be held by a small group that is vocal on Twitter, and I don't think it's representative for the neurodiversity community as a whole, but it's clearly a sentiment that exists. Fast forward to 2023 and TikTok is full of teenagers celebrating their neurodiversity, some of them self-diagnosed. Now you might say there's nothing wrong with teenagers wanting to feel good about themselves, and I fully agree. 
The neurodiversity movement has a point. Our world is built for typical people, and typical people are often not mindful of those who are less typical. In most cases, I think not so much because typical people are actively mean, but passively careless. If you're too tall or too short, too loud or too quiet or too anything really, you'll have trouble fitting in. Some people's brains don't work like yours, but that doesn't mean they are the problem. The problem might be that you're not making the necessary effort trying to understand them. Paying attention to those outside a standard deviation of the average makes their lives easier and enriches our society. That sounds all well and good. Problem is that most neurodivergent people you see on TikTok are those well enough to produce TikToks. Yeah. And in contrast to being queer or female, ASD can in severe cases significantly impair a person's ability to live independently. This is why the neurodiversity movement has seen somewhat of a backlash in recent years, primarily from caregivers of people with level 3 ASD who feel like talking about internalized ableism doesn't help. For example, the London-based neurobiologist Moab Constandi has written an article for E.ON titled Against Neurodiversity, in which he draws attention to a worrying trend of romanticizing autism that has extended to other conditions that can be severe, debilitating and life-threatening, such as depression and schizophrenia. He writes that the idea that autism is a variation of normal is at odds with scientific understanding of the condition, and that in their zealous pursuit of autistic rights, some advocates have become authoritarian and militant, harassing and bullying anyone who dares to portray autism negatively or expresses a desire for treatment or cure. Tom Clements, who is autistic himself, wrote in an opinion piece in The Guardian that many Sorry about that, guys. I, well, there we go. Okay. So that is a tough thing because on one hand, um, if you are someone who has no cognitive um, impairments and you have autism, you, don't you have a right to take up for people who do have cognitive impairments, who do have like level three autism? And I think there's something to be said of that, um, of that attitude. Um, but on the other side, I think what happens, is, like, like she said, where you do have caregivers, where you do have parents who love their children. But think of it this way, right? So you have a child who has level three autism that will need care for their entire lives. And you you're, you, you have this child, like, like, like right now, my mother is in her 70s. And uh, she's a healthy 70-year-old. But what if I had level three autism? What if, if I needed care? Right. What if when I had like I have meltdowns sometimes and my meltdowns consist of me having a hissy fit and leaving. But what if my meltdowns consisted of me getting physical, of banking things, of getting violent, which does happen. What even if my 70 year old, I mean, my 70 year old woman, my 70 year old, woman, my 70 year old uh, mother could not deal with that. So long before then, I mean, if, if I had had cognitive impairments at the age of 20, when she could, I guess, well, maybe not 20, because you know, I'm 20 years old. But when I was a teenager, she has to know, like, look, who's going to take care of him? You know, even if I didn't, you know, even if my meltdowns manifest in the way they do now, where I just shut down and I'm not violent, okay. But she knows that eventually... You know, it's that thing like I love my child, but who's going to be around to take care of them? So I think one thing that a lot of people with autism do when they do criticize this, I guess, this quote, search for a cure is that just the 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 despair and fear that caretakers have, not the caretakers who wish their children had ever been born, but the caretakers who worry about their children once they're no longer around. Um, I mean, it's, it's a complicated issue and I am sympathetic to, I am sympathetic to that. Let me see if I can. Any now self-identify as autistic as though autism were a fashion label rather than a debilitating disorder. And that such an attitude has led to the marginalization of autistic people who, by virtue of their disability, are unable to speak and rely on others to do so on their behalf. 
Some neurodivergent people have pushed back, pointing out that claimants use the term high functioning to refer to himself and that such functioning labels should not be used because they suggest some people with ASD do not need help. Others complain that Clemens is a very active troll who spends a lot of time misrepresenting the neurodiversity movement and that he accuses autistic people of not actually being autistic. I didn't know anything about this when I started making this video. I was just trying to understand the symptoms of autism and had no idea the topic had become so controversial. But I hope that this rundown helps you make a little sense of what's going on. In summary, autism spectrum disorder is a mental health condition that subsumes what was previously called autism and Asperger's syndrome. It's more common than you might think, affecting more than one in a hundred people. Most of them are able to live a fairly normal life, but face challenges, especially at work and in social interactions. Many of them prefer to refer to themselves as neurodivergent and try to raise awareness for the challenges they are facing. But the neurodiversity movement has been criticized for trivializing the problems of those most severely affected. I've been accused several times of being autistic or having Asperger's syndrome. It normally comes after a long list of complaints about how I'm rude and arrogant, Asperger. talk like a robot, am about as empathetic as a brick and similarly spontaneous, but considerably less social. Luckily, there's an online self-test you can do for this. So let's see how neurodivergent I am. Here we go. Your autism spectrum symptoms are high. I think that's wrong. I'm really just rude or German, but then I repeat myself. What do you think about neurodiversity? Are you autistic yourself or have autistic children? Let us know in the comments. I've often wished I could collect all. Okay. Okay, so uh, I did not watch any other criticisms of that video because I didn't want to be influenced by them and now i'm going to i'm actually going to watch the other criticisms and, th and think what i what kind of like see what i think about them this video ran a little long i, I get long winded i didn't want it to be over an hour so i'm going to cut this out now uh i have much else to say i took that same test by the way after watching this video i'll post it there and that's not really surprising um most of my i guess um symptoms or whatever you want to call it go into sensory issues and kind of interacting with people. Um, and some, definitely some repetitive behaviors. I think most of the problem with this video is that there, there, the research could have been a little deeper when she was, um, when she was looking at like organizations like Autism Speaks and different, and different treatments for people with autism. Um, it's complicated. And the reason so many people with, uh, this, I keep saying with, but so many people who have autism are aware of these things because it's kind of ironic. One of the one of the things associated with autism is getting fixated and having a special interest. So it's one of those things. Once people, you already have a tendency to do this. Once people find out they may be on the uh, they may be on the spectrum, they become like really really interested in it, and they do they do deep dives and they you know they really do the research. Which, you know, it's, like I said, it's interesting because that's one of the, the traits, the qualities, behaviors, whatever associated with autism. For the most part, if I told somebody I was on uh, or I was on the spectrum of autism and they said, OK, and then the next day they came to me and said they watched this video, I would not have a problem with um, I would not have a problem with the information that they would ga gain from watching this video. Uh, I think that they, they emphasize the fact that it is a spectrum and maybe the thing they can do is maybe identify people who who are confirmed to have autism, who are well known, like Anthony Hopkins, um, Daryl, uh, or uh, I said Daryl, I want to say Daryl Hammond, Daryl Hannah, the actress, it's people who are I mean, Court, Courtney Love, but I don't know if that's a good example. Sorry, I mean, like I like Hole, but I don't know if. She's, she's kind of, you know, but 
yeah, I think Dan Aykroyd, pretty sure Dan Aykroyd. So to show that just because you know you, there are people who have autism who are who are confirmed to have autism who do have these full lives and and, and, and you know and celebrities and whatever, and it isn't all it isn't just all uh, anxiety, fear, and the inability to make friends. But uh, anyway, I hope you guys uh, liked the video and. Uh, Thank you.